Okay, I think we're ready to start. I will be doing that really shortly. And uh, let me start with a short introduction. So my name is Igor. I'm a head of developer relations here at Cube. I've been your host and uh, speaker at some of the previous webinars. So those of you who are who joining this as, as not your first, but maybe maybe second or third webinar, probably should know me already. Um, I'm also joined today by Nathan Kitzman, who has recently joined Cube uh, to lead our events. I'm really excited about that. Oh, Nathan has enabled his video. So uh, Nathan, let me give you just uh, just the mic to say a few words to the audience. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nathan Kitzman. Um, I'm super excited to be joining Cube um, and getting a chance to work with Igor and team. Um, so it's a pleasure to meet you all. And um, um, I'm ready to uh, start this fun process and um, join the webinars and community. Amazing. Yeah. And um, with that, We've got over 40 participants live, so let's get started. Uh, I'll start with sharing my screen, actually. Okay, here it is. So the topic of today's webinar is replacing Redis with Cube Store or, or migrating from the former to the latter. And I think this is going to be a fun one because we'll have a chance not only to understand um, the nitty gritty details of this most recent infrastructure update to Cube, but also we'll have a chance to deep dive into the Cube's inner workings. So yeah, let me remind everyone that, well, we, we have our code of conduct and I encourage everyone to maintain this open welcoming environment and uh, be respectful to everyone. And uh, well, in case you, this code is violated, feel free to contact us at contact.cube.dev. Uh, just a few quick notes for us to get started. So obviously feel free to use this Q and A uh, tab to be asking your questions as we go through the webinar. We'll have a few uh, moments when we will be stopping for the Q and A sessions during the webinars. So having your questions ready and able will certainly help. Uh, also, if, if you have an observation, which is not a question, feel free to pause it to the chat. Also, uh, we'll, be, we'll be running Cube locally uh, during the webinar for some demos, and also we'll be using um, Cube Cloud for a bit. Um, so everything that we'll be demoing today, it's uh, completely relevant, both for Cube Core, which is open source version of Cube, and also, uh, and also the Cube Cloud environment. So, um, well, feel free to, to check with yourself. Also, uh, yeah, obviously we'll be recording this webinar, this webinar uh, and the recording will be available at our events page, well, alongside the other recordings for other events we've been running. And yeah, uh, also upon the completion of this uh, webinar, in some time you'll receive a survey. Well, I would definitely appreciate if we'll get some feedback. It will help us improve uh, further events and also um, just understand whether we, we did a great job on this webinar or not. So the feedback is highly appreciated. Okay, so this is the agenda for today's webinar. Um, we'll start with just a quick note about what Cube is, right? For those of you who are quite new to Cube. And then we'll, we'll talk about the topic of this webinar, right? Uh, the why did we decide it uh, more than six months ago, actually, to be replacing Redis um, and removing this from the stack that you'll need to run to run a Kube deployment and replace that with Kube Store. And then we'll also talk about the timeline for that and the timings for the steps that probably most of you will be taking to actually do this migration. And We'll, we'll see what it takes to do the upgrade in case you're using Cube Core or Cube Cloud. It's pretty simple. And actually, the, the most, most simple answer to the previous uh, question, like when to do this, is actually you can do it just today and uh, the steps are extremely simple. 
also uh, we'll spend some time for a deep dive session so you folks better understand how uh, such complex things like in-memory cache and query key management work in Cube, so you have better understanding uh, about why we've, deci we've decided to do this change and what are their implications of the change for the stability and reliability uh, and maintainability of Cube deployments. Well, short answer, well, that would be a re re really good change and the reliability and stability would improve. Well, if you had any issues with writers, you, you won't from now on. This is a good good thing. Yeah, and, uh, and we'll spend the rest of their this six minute session for your questions. And actually, since we are um, since we are we'll probably be spending some time to learn more about each other, let me start this poll. Uh, this, I call this a welcome poll, so so you'll you'll be able to to share some info that would be helpful for us um, to understand how relevant this webinar is or what's your experience with Cube. So I started this one and uh, yeah, I would highly appreciate if you if you answer it and provide the questions. And with that, let's let's start. So uh, just for the background, uh, so so we are on the same page and you know, on what Cube is and what kind of problem we solve. So our mission as a company behind Cube is to um, provide you with the right tools so you can build the next generation of the data-driven apps. And we are, those tools are basically solving the problem of data accessibility and consistency. So with, with, with the tools that we are building, we are able to provide access to data, whatever, wherever it is stored and wherever you need you need to deliver and make sure that the metrics that you calculate with that, with that data are consistent and uh, the experiences that you create for your end users with Cube uh, are trustworthy. So no one, no one wonders you know, whether they can trust in your data or not. So uh, the two main use cases that Cube supports, this is embedded in leaks and it really shines there, and also the universal semantic layer. And I believe this is also where Cube is really strong, given how many data sources and data consumers Cube support, and also with the plethora of other features. Well, I think Cube is unmatched there. So if you're building a data app uh, and uh, embedded analytics or semantic layer, other use cases um, you're thinking about, well, Cube should be a good match. And uh, just to give more context about why the problem of accessibility is consistency is so important, let me show you this, um, this, this schema. Well, and uh, our observation is that uh, most data teams have many data sources or many um, places from which they uh, need to read data and take, in, take it into account. And also their data consumers and users they really want to have custom tailored uh, experiences. So, so, so you know, one team might might want to use a BI tool, another team might enjoy exploring the data in a data notebook, and uh, the development team, your engineering team, uh, might want to enhance the experience for your end users, for their end users, uh, with some embedded analytics, right? And that's that's pretty much understandable, but that's what what might be um, quite demanding, right? Because you, you need a tool that could solve that, that problem. And uh, well, uh, the tool that we are building, um, it pretty much, mm, it, it pretty much there. So the semantic layer that we are building, uh, it is able to connect uh, all your data sources to whatever data consumer you have, be it you know a, a, a BI tool, a data workspace, or a uh, front end app and provide you with a data modeling, access control, caching, and um, a spectrum of APIs. So, so you can model your data, ensure its, its access to it is secured, and also that the data is consistent, not only in terms of how metrics are calculated, but also in terms of the speed of access to it. So basically you get sub-second 
uh, query latency and uh, decent concurrency. So that's Cube. And here we go to the topic of this webinar, right? So uh, why actually to migrate from, um, from Redis and uh, what's all the fuss about? So um, let me start with this architecture diagram, which most of you would recognize, well, at least those of you who are using Cube already, right? Because this is what, uh, what your Cube deployment would usually look like. So uh, you, usually you have at least one or maybe uh, several API instances that serve your uh, API request. And obviously if you have multiple instances, you um, have a load balancer in front of them. Uh, that would distribute the load over those instances. Also, uh, you'll have a refresh worker that would be connected to your database or data warehouse, and refresh worker will be taking care of the timely refre refreshing your, your data. And uh, refresh worker would be storing the data in, the, in a specialized um, storage, which is called Cube Store, that's custom built for Cube. And uh, Cube store in its turn would be uh, represented by a router and a number of Cube store workers, well, at least two of them, but you can definitely have more to spread the load. And uh, uh, the API instances would be serving the requests, mostly reading the data from, from Cube store. And also the very last piece of this equation is, is Redis, right? So here, here I have a single node um, Redis cluster. However, well, in its turn, it also can be represented by a multi-node cluster. And um, the role of Redis is to coordinate the work of all uh, API instances and the refresh worker, and uh, also to serve as an in-memory cache. So um, when a query hits Cube, uh, Redis is checked whether a similar or just the same query have been processed recently and if, it, and, and, and if it was, and if the data is not stale, then there, the second query would be served from Redis. And also the whole coordination and of, 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 of queries running against Cube and most, more importantly running against database, uh, it's performed using Redis. So it's quite a crucial piece of uh, the architecture, right? So uh, with that, Let's be moving, move on. So um, as you probably know, Redis is an open source in-memory data store. So it's quite a specialized one. And uh, as I said, it serves as this kind of first layer of Cube's caching subsystem, right? So uh, the good things that Redis provides are basically memory caching and query queue management, right? And uh, the direct benefits of having this in-memory cache are the following, right? So as I said, but if you have identical queries hitting your Cube API instances, uh, only one of them would actually hit the uh, data source. And until, unless the data is not stale, the rest of the identical queries will be just, they'll be just hitting this in-memory cache. Uh, also, that having this uh, layer of coordination and having this in-memory cache uh, alongside your API instances, that allows you to actually have as um, many API instances as you want and use this to horizontally scale your Cube deployment. Uh, and one, import, one more important thing is that, well, uh, regardless of um, whichever API instance is hit with your API query, having this um, memory cache uh, underneath allows uh, the API instances to, to be in, in impotent ones. So it just means that uh, any client might be sending uh, queries to any API instance and then will be processed correctly. So there is no need to implement any, any kind of sticky uh, behavior. It just works if you just maybe evenly distribute the load over multiple API instances. So that's the benefits of in-memory cache. What about query queue? So having this queue where you and take account of every query that's running against your database, uh, it gives you an ability to actually make sure that your database is not overloaded with, with access requests, right? So if, if, you're, if you're getting like 
you know, one or two requests per second and can come into your Cube API. And then out of blue, 100 requests per second come. Uh, well, that, that wouldn't be an issue because uh, they'll be all queued and uh, Cube will use that queue of requests to make sure that on the allowed number, on the limited number of requests would be actually run against your database, right? That might not be that crucial for uh, another scaling cloud-based data warehouses. But if you, for some reason, have, um, I would say, a traditional database uh, behind you, it may be Postgres, it might be ClickHouse, then actually safeguarding the database from excess load might be a good thing, right? And um, that kind of architecture with the query queue also uh, provides queue with the ability to uh, cancel those like those long running queries which uh, don't have any clients waiting for the results. Well, your end user might be navigating through the pages of your uh, web application or through the screens of your BI tool, right? And uh, uh, if if that user have run a query and then just navigated you know somewhere else, then that query. The, the results for this query they are not needed anymore, right? Um, and when Cube understands that, it can just cancel the underlying query to the data source and uh, evict that uh, item from the queue. That's how it works. And also, we all know that uh, by nature, an HTTP protocol uh, is not designed for long running queries. So if you're building embedded analytics experience and you're using Cube Client, the JavaScript SDK that we provide to send the queries, then you know that you can just you know wait uh, for the result, result indefinitely, right? And that's also uh, implemented through this query queue. So the client can be continuously polling uh, Cube and that would be checking the queue whether the query has, has been fulfilled or not. So these are very crucial things for of uh, how everything works in Cube, right? And the Redis uh, has been used as a storage um, uh, for, for these two pieces. And um, right now we are migrating away from that. And uh, here are the top three reasons. So uh, the most crucial one, and this is something that we've been hearing a lot from, from you folks, from uh, the Cube community, from the Cube Cloud users, is that, um, actually running a highly available uh, or potentially even sharded or partitioned uh, Redis cluster, this is very hard, right? So uh, the minimal reliable configuration will require you to run at least three uh, nodes and you know that would be nodes of Redis and each one should be coupled with a Redis Sentinel lab. Well, that's, that's, that's not you know, too hard, but it's still hard. And also, and that's even more important, uh, in production setting, you know, if you have high load, uh, you, you know, if you have a lot of requests and kind of into cube, that that load would also, you know, be distributed over your Redis cluster. And uh, under high load, it just, you know, becomes, you know, less and less um, reliable, consumes a lot of resources. So you have to um, properly manage that. That, that 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 part and and, and uh, scale your Redis cluster as well. So that that that, that maybe not what you actually aimed for when you got started with Cube. Uh, yeah, and this is just a screenshot from the Redis docs that well shows the basic setup, right? Um, but that's with three three nodes in the cluster. But probably you'll end up with with more when you scale your Redis setup. That should be highly available. Okay, the second reason for the migration is uh, that, well, actually it turned out as we were exploring how you folks are using Cube, it, that Redis actually might not be the best fit for the storage, right? So it works good for the in-memory cache because, well, because, well, this is, this is what a memory data store should actually be designed for. However, it's still not very good for their um, skin areas that we that we have here here at Cube, right? So uh, most of the time, you what we need to store there it is a columnar data, right? The uh, columns of data that are the results of some queries, right? And uh, what you can store 
in, in Redis. This is just, you know, JSONs, right? And then you need to serialize them and deserialize them uh, from strings and to strings. This is just not what Redis was prepared for. And, um, and also uh, some of the data structures, uh, some of the payloads that we that need to be stored in Redis, uh, they may take up to a megabyte of data, right? And uh, updating uh, some keys in Redis might require, might incur actually a very, very, very big volume of traffic, you know, going uh, inside the cube cluster. So that's not very convenient, and that's what we uh, need to get rid of. And also, it turned out that especially for the query queue scenario, Redis is not well suited. So um, this is this is a screenshot from the docs that we have uh, somewhere in the Cube's open source wrapper. Don't try to test anything from here. Just uh, this is an illustration of how complex query queue management um, inside Cube is, right? Uh, so yeah, um, this is this and this is not what we can easily implement uh, with the Redis as a storage. And also. Uh, all the time, with more than three years that Cube exists, we've been uh, struggling with providing good um, support for, 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 for Redis, right? So uh, there are lots of issues on GitHub that you folks been fi uh, filing uh, with regard to how Redis worked for you. And also we, we even got to implement this, um, this configuration options that allows some of you to switch from using the uh, not the Shredis client to IR Redis client. Well, some well, one of them work uh, good in one scenario, the other one works good in, the, in, in others. Well, specifically when Redis Sentinel needs to be used, it's just a lot of unneeded configuration, right? That's not something that you aim for, I believe. And uh, what, el what else? is not good at that using this in-memory data store uh, for managing the data queue required us to uh, to have this transactions and have this multi-operations with a lot of um, operations within mean, right? So the, the maintenance of, of this code, and this is just excerpts of some of the source code that we have uh, inside, inside Cube, this, 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 this was a nightmare, right? So it's not unbearable. That's, that's, that's something we can fully do, but that's something that we're not enjoying, uh, right? So uh, getting rid of this uh, error prone and hard to maintain code that is something simpler. This is actually one of the goals. So this is, again, this is architecture that you would um, usually, usually see, right? And uh, this is what we can do. Uh, as you can see on this architecture, we, we have two storages in there, right? We have Redis, which is the memory store. And we also have Cube Store, which we uh, ourselves have designed and built specifically to serve the distributed and very performant um, data store inside Cube, right? And we just, this was, I wouldn't say that it was an epiphany, right? But uh, this was something that we were really glad to understand, right? We already have to uh, really, really good custom built, custom tailored for Cube um, storage. And uh, we can we can probably give it a go, we can use it. So Cube Store really comes to the to the rescue. So until now it served uh, this uh, secondary layer of the Cube's caching subsystem and it provide, uh, it, it, it stored pre-aggregations and uh, it, it served uh, the queries that were incoming to Cube. And, so, so it provided you with the sub-second latency and high concurrency. And now we've decided that uh, the right move would be to, to be removing Redis from, uh, from the architecture and just uh, enhancing Cube Store so it can also serve as an in-memory cache and as a query queue. So without Redis, uh, the updated architecture that, well, I believe we'll see in the deployments that you folks will be running really soon, uh, uh, here's what we got, right? So no Redis, but Cube Store is taking over some more uh, functionalities, and uh, the architecture is, is 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 much simpler overall, right? So mm, you you don't need to run or to run your Redis cluster. You you just you just run API instances, a refresh worker, and the Cube Store cluster. Uh, yeah. So that's it for the introduction introductory part, and uh, with that, I'd like to actually answer the question like when the right time to migrate. 
and the answer is well today right <laughs> so uh, this is a re re release schedule so um, more than two weeks ago we already released uh, this uh, version 0.31.60 which i call the redis free preview version and the thing is it fully supports working without redis however well the default settings are intact right so you can you can feel free to upgrade to this version or any version in, in the dot 31 um, branch and well everything will be working as it was working but if you wish to use on the cube store and, and uh, in the architecture and stop using radius you can just provide this environment variable cube just cache and key driver equals cube store and well and then you don't need radius so that it's that simple um really soon i guess it's maybe you know by the end of this week or you know maybe next week we'll be releasing the uh, minor version uh, 32 right that would swap the defaults right so it would still have their support for redis but the cube store will be used for the memory cache and query queue by default. If you wanna revert this behavior file, say you upgrade to that, that's, that's what I encourage you to do. But if for some reason you wanna revert this behavior, then you can just say keep just cache and queue driver equals Redis, boom, you're back with Redis. However, feel free to remove that and also remove Redis from your stack when you feel to. And, um, Later this year, uh, we'll we'll be releasing you know in a new in, a new version which would just have the um, the support for Redis deprecated right, and then you'll have no this no no environment variables to to fine tune. It will just you know uh, it will be just working with Kube Store out of the box, and that's it, right? So this is a release schedule for Kube Core. So updating your uh, your installations and deployments of kube core is, is is very simple so if you're running kube locally you don't need to do anything right you can just you just upgrade this is a single node uh installations right so locally you you run kube as a single node most likely just as a single docker container right so you can just you know upgrade to the 31 or 32 and uh, you'll be good right nothing to do if you're uh, in case you're running Cube in production, like you know, you're self-hosting Cube, uh, this is this is this is where you 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 need to uh, to check if you already have your have Cube Store running. If you're using it for pre-aggregations, which is well, which is really a good choice, right? And uh, congrats on that. Then, well, you just upgrade to 31 or or 32 when it's available. And uh, well, you set up that uh, environment variable, and you just remove Redis from your stack. Nothing, nothing else to do. It, it will just be working out of the box. And uh, if you're also running Kube in, in prod, if you're self-hosting it, but you haven't had the chance to use Kube Store, well, that's the right time. So also, what you what you need to do is to upgrade uh, to the right version. Well, and actually start running Kube Store. And uh, if you don't want to um use pre-aggregations yet something that you can do is just run a single instance just just keep store router um and that would be that would be it so you can just r run the keep store router that would be the start of your migration and then again you you can just feel free to remove radius uh from your stack uh, after that when you feel like you really need the power of pre-aggregations and i believe that should happen, you know, sooner than later, um, so your end users can enjoy subsequent latency of the queries. Then you just add um, cube store workers, and and you're done. And also, uh, I understand that upgrading uh, and and migrating your production deployment might be a risky thing, or at least something that you uh, need to prepare for, right? And one option that would not require you to allocate more resources or to rethink how your um, de deployment process works. That might be just 
deploying a staging version of your existing uh, installation to KubeCloud, right? So you can you can you can run your production uh, environment as it is, but you can you can sign up for for KubeCloud and uh, well possibly use a free tire um, that we're providing just to, to set up your staging version, test it without Redis, and every, if everything works smoothly well, then you can just feel free to apply the same settings to your production environment. Okay, let's talk about KubeCloud. Uh, upgrading KubeCloud uh, is uh, much easier, right? So we already have the preview version available in the latest channel. This is this is a version uh, channel that we have in KubeCloud. And uh, uh, we also, uh, we also be releasing the Redis free version, the 32 minor, uh, to the latest channel really soon. So, so you can just navigate to your settings and uh, uh, upgrade, you know, just today. And let me actually show how that can be done. So I'll just log into, well, some, uh, some deployment that I use for workshops. I'll take, you know, maybe this one. That doesn't matter. I navigate to settings. And here under settings general, I have this cube version, right? And I can, I can just say, hey, I want to use this latest, the 3169. Uh, and that's it. I just click, I apply. And, and here in, in a few seconds, we'll, we'll just see that, yeah, the cube version has updated and uh, the cube will be redeployed. That it's that simple in Cube Cloud. You also should like with this kind of thirty one sixty nine. You'll you also need to go to settings, environment variables here and uh, and say that your um, that your driver is Cube Store. But you know that's also just a few just a few clicks. Uh, okay. So yeah, this is what you. What you're doing in Cube Cloud, just switching the version latest channel and applying an environment variable. Yeah, and also something that you can consider doing is, well, spinning up a separate deployment so you can test this config. And if it works for you, feel free to migrate. Okay, I see that we 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 have some questions in uh, in the chat, so let me take them. So this is our first Q and A session. So yeah, let's see what we got in the Q and A tab. Uh, so the question is if if there is any difference with regard to performance and API latencies, if 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 the switch from Cube Store to Cube Store from Redis is done, well, uh, it depends, and it depends on you know how depends on which load you have. Like if if you if on average you're getting like you know maybe one request per second or less, then probably after the upgrade, the change would be um, not visible, right? It's not something that you'll be able to see. However, if your if your load is um, is more substantial, right? Or if if there are um, some bursts in the load, right? So when you have some, you know, really hot hour, right? Uh, then the requests are com coming. You know that would that would make make a difference and and actually doing doing the upgrade would be would be, would be preferred and also as i said um i think that even regardless of what kind of you know load profile you have you should consider upgrading because it will simplify your setup no more redis nodes to run uh, and uh, well cube store is a beta proven solution we we've been developing it for more than 2 years already so that's uh, I think that's definitely should be tried. Okay, I'm moving on to the question uh, from Mattel, right? So the question is, if, if there's a way to run a test on staging with KubeCloud without, without affecting production? Well, actually, actually there is, it's not specific to, to the webinar indeed, but uh, uh, yeah, you can, you can feel free to, well, um, to create any number of uh, deployments within your uh, KubeCloud account, right? So let me just quickly show you uh, and we can move on. So you can you can have any number of 
deployments. And uh, if you if you decide to spin up uh, another one, right, that would totally uh, have no effect on the existing uh, deployments, right? So feel free to create as, as much as you want. That's that's a tool that you have. Uh, yeah, and uh, actually, the that 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 new deployment might be might be connected to the same data source or other data sources that really doesn't make a difference. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next question. Yeah, okay. The question is whether the support for Oracle uh, uh, is present. Well, uh, this is this is what it supports. You can. You can feel free to check the docs, and yeah, I see that you already um, you already uh, sent your your message to our community Slack. Well, you can probably tag me. Uh, I'm Igor Lukanin. You could just say at Igor Lukanin there, and I'll be happy to assist you. Or or it may be someone else from the Cube team, or maybe someone from Cube Heroes, or some other community members. Well, but feel free to tag me. I'll uh, I'll take a look. The next question is, can Cube Store be used as an expert bucket while also being used for queuing and caching? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just rephrase, rephrase this question. So I think, um, yeah, actually the question is whether Cube Store can be used as a, you know, to serve pre-aggregations and also the in-memory cache and also the query queue. Uh, well, yes and yes and yes. So uh, with this change, with this update, Cube Store becomes you know, their ultimate and almighty uh, only storage that, that is needed in their uh, Cube architecture. So yes, feel free to just move Redis and use Cube Store for everything. Um, okay, then the question is that uh, some folks have done the deployment to uh, Elastic, yeah, to, to uh, EKS, Right, you're using the Kubernetes manifest provided in the, I guess, on the GitHub, right? And there was a link from our docs. So uh, the question is whether there is any migration guide. Well, uh, I think we'll have some some notes in our docs, but uh, even even more important than that, I'll just you know show you how that can be done uh, during this webinar, maybe in ten minutes, right? So it's 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 pretty damn simple. Okay, and the last question that I that I see so far is that whether we have any plans. Um, yeah, the, the question is about application performance monitoring and, and having metrics to observe uh, what's happening. Well, I'm happy to, well, maybe not to announce, but just happy to share that one of the things that the team has been working recently, this is the improvements to their, uh, performance monitoring and you know how metrics are represented within cube right and that's something that will be uh releasing and announcing soon and i also think that there is a way to preview that new functionality in cube cloud right so uh well feel free to you know mm, you know just you know contact us through intercom within your cube cloud um account or or maybe just navigate to our website cube.dev and uh, contact us through the contact for uh there will be happy to preview that to you. Okay, and uh, there is also a question about some um, error, I guess it's happening. Well, I don't really have an answer for that right now, but feel free to maybe uh, again, as I said, tag me and ping me in the in the community Slack. I'll be happy to take a look later. Um, okay, so let's be moving on. We have an exciting demo part. And before we do that, let me actually uh, run another poll, right? So let me end the one that, that we ran. And I'm really happy to see that a lot of you folks, mm, well, are quite new to this webinar as well. Again, um, welcome, I'll be happy. If you if you if, if that's something that you that you that you like, and um, let me launch another poll and proceed. Okay, moving on. 
um, I have a demo for you actually, right? So um, that demo would, would help us better understand the inner workings of the memory cache and query queue within cube, right? Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. And also maybe that stuff that will reveal something for you. So uh, yeah, that's first, let's, let's review their architecture. And actually this is the same that I've been already showing you, right? So a few API instances, a cube store uh, cluster with a rotor and a couple of workers, a fresh worker, Redis, and a load balancer, right? And uh, actually I have this stack um, running on my machine uh, in Docker, right? So it's, it's called by Redis, and this is number of containers. And I can actually show you how uh, that's defined in the Docker Compose file, right? So this is a Docker Compose file and uh, I'll just fold everything here so, so you can check. So we have uh, a load balancer. This is just an Nginx, right? That would distribute the load over the two API instances. Uh, we have those API instances um, with, you know, almost most recent cube version, right? I guess you know, 69 is the latest one. It's connected to uh, cloud-based Postgres database, right? We also have it connected to Kipster router. Um, and also we have it connected to Redis. Uh, and that's it, right? So this is the first API instance. The second one is also set up with the same uh, configuration connected to Kipster connected to Redis as well. We have our refresh worker with the same config. Uh, we have Kipster router with connections to a couple of workers. We have those workers. And the last one is, uh, well, a single node um, Redis installation, right? So let's go ahead and just uh, run this stack. So everything started and uh, yeah, we can observe that, well, everything's healthy, healthy here. If I, decide to navigate to their uh to the port uh for talent right and just run a few requests we'll see here that they are in they they're hitting um they're hitting the engines right and and then and then the api instances right um what else do we have let's review the data model that's pretty much quite a simple one right so we have it here under schema, right? And it's, yeah, it's a very simplistic one. So, so we have, you know, a table with some orders and uh, we have a single measure called count. We'll be just counting those orders. And also we have a single time dimension, which is called created that and we'll be able to, um, uh, to slice their orders by this time dimension. It's, it's that simple. Okay. We'll also be using a couple of auxiliary tools. One of them is called K6. It's an open source uh, load testing tool. We'll, we'll be using that to generate some requests. And another one is called Medis. And this is actually uh, a Mac OS based graphical user interface for, for Redis. So since we have Redis running already, I'll just press connect. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we'll see that there are a couple of keys within Redis, but no entries for the cached results because no queries have been run so far. We'll, we'll, do, it, we'll, we'll do it right now, actually. So uh, with this uh, stack running locally on my machine, uh, let's actually run some queries. So yeah, the first query that we'll be running, uh, that would be you know quite a trivial one, right? So it's, it's gonna be a single measure query. Let me actually, copy this from from the slide and then um, and then show you what's that file uh, one 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 dot js contains right so we'll be running uh writing a query you know writing requests with the query you know for for five seconds you know multiple times maybe you know, multiple thousands of times right so that will be hitting hitting cube with this is our validation header, and that's our query, right? So we'll just, you know, saying, hey, uh, how many orders are in there, right? 
and we'll be doing this multiple times. Okay, I'm going to the console, opening a new one, and this is what I'm running. Okay, so this is the first query. Uh, it's running for five seconds. Okay, we see that, you know, uh, more than 2,000 queries have been run. Uh, and, and here are some some metrics, right? So so we see that the median time of a query was just uh, 13 milliseconds, but, and, and, and their uh, 95th percentile, uh, it's it's quite, it's quite low as well, right? So, so only about like 30 milliseconds, but the maximum time was, you know, more than a second. Well, um, how that, did it happen? Well, obviously uh, the, the only query that, that, that took on, uh, over one second, that was a query that actually hit the database, but the rest of the queries, well, more than uh, 2000 of them, they just have hit the in-memory cache, right? And uh, that's why the median time is just in you know, 13 milliseconds. Okay, let's let's check what's what's in the radius. Uh, okay, we have a couple of keys have, have been added here, right? And uh, yeah, we see that a couple of queries have been run against cube. And if we check this key, this new key, we'll see that, well, this is actually the, the count of orders, right? We see that, uh, well, lowest count equals uh, 10,000. Well, that's it, right? And if we mm, if we decide to run this query again, well, we'll see the same picture, and this memory cache will be will be will be reused. Okay. Mm. So yeah, data is cached in Redis only a single value. So our database is hit only once. Well, and they, yeah, uh, we can also see that the load it was distributed over API instances, right? So we can we can see this this the instance number two in green, the instance number nine in yellow, right? They are the cloud is distributed across them. Okay, let's run the second query. And that query is quite similar. Also we'll be running that for five seconds, right? But the difference from the first one is that we're not only uh, querying for this count, but also querying for the time dimension within months chronology, right? So if we run that, we'll see a similar picture in terms of latency distribution, right? So here it is. Median is on the 20 milliseconds, you know, 95th percentile is quite similar, but also, you know, there was a query that actually hit the database that's over a second, right? But let's 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 review what we have in Redis, right? We have one more new, one more key here, and this is the key uh, where where the results of that query was stored, right? And uh, well, so this is this is the number of orders for the January January uh, twenty nineteen, then February, March, etc., all the way uh, down here, right? And uh, well, this is the cached value for that for that query. Uh, right, so so we can see that different different queries where right, they indeed uh, get different places in the memory cache for the cache data, um, right? And also we see that we're 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 now storing pairs of of, of rows, or pair, pairs of values that, that actually form two columns, and that uh, that's not what actually. Right, this is well suited for, right? So we we need to serialize this in JSON and then deserialize it. Well, and if if it's not just maybe a kilobyte of data, but a megabyte of data, that would take some time to do this uh, serialization and unserialization. So let's run another query, query number three. The only difference from the second one is that uh, we are not only querying for. Uh, for the count and the time dimension, but but every query will be, will have a randomized uh, boundaries in 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 date range, right? So every query would be different from the other one, and uh, well, some of them might be, might you know by chance uh, might be equal, but you know they'll they'll they'll, they'll be different uh, in the general case, right? So if we run that. We'll see an interesting picture. So it, it would be vastly different. Okay, so 
uh, as, as we can see, their median latency is way over a second now, right? And well, the, the same is true for the, for the, for the Maxim one. Why is that? Uh, well, obviously, because now I've been running, you know, uh, many uh, queries which are you know, different from each other, then the database uh, needed to be hit multiple times, right? And if we go and observe what's in there in the memory cache, we'll see a lot of uh, cached result there, and they are all different, right? So for, uh, there was there was a query that you know is a date range from the June. 2020 to say uh, June, June 20, 2022, et cetera, right? And this is, this are they all different? Well, okay, and th this is what happens when you don't use pre-aggregation and uh, you you run queries that, that hit the database um, every time, right? Um, yeah, so this is actually, um, we we're actually halfway through the demo, and this is this is I think a good illustration of how a memory cache works, right? So if you have identical queries, they will be deduplicated and served from cache. Uh, you can have multiple API instances, and the load would be uh, spread across them, and uh, they are all important. It means that uh, well, that your API is our cube API is important. It means that uh, you can just evenly distribute the load and uh, the mm, in memory cache will just take care of serving those queries correctly. Okay, and uh, we actually have the last query, the query number four that we'd like to run. Mm. Uh, and uh, actually, this is the same query that we've been running. Uh, like it is the same as the, the query number three, right? Again, just count and time dimension and some randomized uh, date range boundaries. However, the only difference is that we'll be running that We'll be running that query for one minute, right? For 60 seconds. Let me run this query right now. And then we'll just go and observe what's happening in Redis, right? So I'll just refresh and we see that some additional data structures appear. It's not only cached values of your queries, but some more complex data structures in here, right? And also, uh, let's take a look at this SQL query standalone default active. When I refresh, we see that there are always two keys in there, but they are updating, right? Hmm, interesting. So what does this all mean? Well, uh, that key that's called SQL query standalone default active, this is their the place where we store the identifiers of the queries which are currently running against your data store, right? So um, we're running against Postgres and by default, Cube makes sure that no, no more than two queries actually are being executed against, against Postgres, right? So that's why we have two in there. Um, you can definitely fine tune that. So so there are some same defaults depending on which database or data warehouse you use. So it's gonna be say 10 for BigQuery. Uh, and then much less, much less for Postgres. So I hope that give, that gives you some understanding of you know how actually query queue management is um, implemented with Redis, right? So so it, it safeguards your data source from the excessive load, right? So just you know the queries will be queued, and then only 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 when there there is room for them, they'll be executed. Also, you're able to cancel stale queries and uh, service long running ones. Okay, so uh, with that background, with all that understanding, I, I just want to uh, emphasize that you know, Cube Store indeed is the next step. So you should really feel free to upgrade to Cube Store because it was purpose built, and right now it would be taking care of in memory cache of query queue and of pre aggregation, so you can have this subsequent latency of your requests. Uh, it's really optimized for high availability and uh, high load. And uh, well, if you're already using Cube Store, that you don't, you can just reuse it. You'll be removing things from from your deployment and uh, simplifying things by removing Redis and just reusing Cube Store. No additional setup or configuration needed. So really, upgrade Cube and remove Redis. And well, 
I believe that your experience would be hassle-free, really seamless, especially if you're running Cube in Cube Cloud, where you just you know, need to use a drop down and uh, switch the channel. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to tell you that, well, given that we had this uh, Cube Redis free preview for uh, more than two weeks already, some of the Cube Cloud uh, users have been running that in production and uh, uh, some of them have really high load. So uh, it, it works, it works really great. And uh, you know, some of the KubeCloud users were able to, to see, um, you know, they, they, they are, they, their deployments which, which serve, you know, more than uh, 200 requests per second actually you no, know, it's quite a, quite a high load, but uh, they were able to see that well. Mm, their Cube Store works really great uh, for them for this purpose of managing the query queue and uh, serving as a numeric cache. Um, okay, so yeah, I just I promised to show you how you can how you can upgrade. Well, that's that's our that's your previous architecture. That's what you've got next. And actually, yeah, the upgrade is that simple. Let me. Let me just stop what we what we've got running here in uh, Docker, and while it's while it's being stopped, I'll just do some updates to my Docker Compose file. I'm removing the Redis, right? I'm also uh, removing this dependency on Redis, uh, and I'm saying, hey, I want to use Cube Store, and I don't want to use Redis. I'm doing this just three times for the refresh worker, and for each API instance. So this is first, and this is the other one. And that is it. That's all I need to do. Just remove Redis and say, hey, I don't want to use, oh, okay. I don't want to use Redis. I want to use Cube Store for my cache and queue. Uh, yeah, that, that's how it's done. We are, we are, we are commenting out Redis. Okay, I saved the Docker Compose file and I'm starting everything again. We can we can go here and see that well the Redis container is not running right, but if we um, run some queries again, we'll see that everything's working. Okay, so yeah, everything's working and uh, the performance is uh, the same or even better. So that's. That was a whole demo. Well, I I have one more slide that I'll just keep it. This is the last one, and let's be right now. So, for those of you who who want to get more context on this update, feel free to check our blog post. We also have their documentation on the deployment. Feel free to check it as well. There is an epic on GitHub that well by provide you an insight on how much work was done by the engineering team to actually. Uh, make this update happen. Feel free to check that, or maybe you know, um, upload that. Just just with a thumbs up, uh, so uh, the folks from engineering get some appreciation for their hard work. Uh, yeah. Also, the whole source code that I've been showing to you, all this you know, Docker Compose file, all the data schema and other stuff, it's available on GitHub. Feel free to check that to run this on your machine and to see. Uh, to see everything for yourself. And truly, yeah, please, you know, migrate from Redis, replace it with Cube Store, and that would be uh, that would be awesome. Okay, uh, if you want to talk to us, you know, mm, feel free to, to use this form on the website. I encourage everyone to join our Slack community. There are almost 8,000 folks in there, data practitioners, app developers. So mm, I'm there as well. Feel free to ping me or any anyone else from Cube, and stay tuned for our uh, our upcoming events. We, we already have um, some planned. Well, we'll have more announced soon. So yeah, feel free to tune in for them. That was actually it. I see there are a couple of questions. Let me uh, let me take take one. So the Bob asks uh, if I have any idea when the Cube Cloud stable version will be will, will be switched to uh, 31.60. So um, I don't have a definite uh, definite timeline for that. However, I think this would be in the you know, most nearest future, maybe days or maybe, maybe 
few weeks to come, right? So, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll actually be publishing uh, a blog post about this update soon. So uh, stay tuned for that, and I, I'll make sure to uh, check with the team and provide some insight into the timeline for you in the blog post. Or you can you can always you know um, just ping ping me or anyone everyone, anyone else from the team on Slack, and uh, uh, we'll give you an answer. So. That's it, no more questions. This is the last slide. Again, folks, I was really excited to host this webinar for you. And uh, yeah, that was, it was really, really great experience. You know, feel free to tune in for our coming webinars. And yeah, okay, so bye folks and uh, see you next time.